Good afternoon, everyone. I'm CNN Health reporter Jacqueline Howard, and I'm here to welcome you to our panel discussion on sleep. As we all know, sleep plays a vital role in our health, but many of us aren't getting enough of it, myself included. And so lack of sleep can put our physical and mental health at risk. And that's why today our group of experts will help us understand what's preventing many of us from a good night's rest. And they'll share their advice on how to improve your quality of sleep. Joining me today, some of the nation's leading experts on sleep and medicine, Dr. Elizabeth Clorman. She's professor of neurology at Harvard Medical School. Dr. Carmela Alcantara, Associate Professor at Columbia University School of Social Work. Dr. Rebecca Spencer, Professor of Psychology and Brain Science at UMass Amherst. And we have Dr. Azizi Seishas, Associate Professor at the University of Miami Miller School of Medicine. Welcome panelists. And now let's begin by exploring first the connection between sleep and physical health. According to the CDC, adults who get less than seven hours of sleep a night are at higher risk for heart attack, asthma, and depression. Dr. Seishas, I'm curious, you've done a lot of research about sleep and specifically cardiovascular disease. So can you tell us what's the connection between sleep and illness, including some of those chronic diseases that I mentioned? Well, thank you so much for having me. Um, before we delve into looking at that linkage, I think we need to have a pretty good understanding of what we mean by sleep health. Sleep health really consists of a wide variety of different things, such as the quality of your sleep, particularly looking at sleepiness and your level of alertness and timing, efficiency, whether or not if someone has a sleep disorder, um, looking at the architecture in terms of the different stages, as well as sleep duration. And in many ways, sleep has significant value value in terms of, you know, you know, helping with significant physiological processes like homeostasis, which is keeping the um, biological um, environment, you know, quite equal and, you know, conserving energy as well as brain functioning. And when you look at all of those functions, as well as the different areas or different ways in which we can look at sleep, not just focusing on duration, there has been a bevy of several studies that have shown that sleep in many ways is associated with mortality, cardiovascular disease, diabetes, mental health, brain health, looking at Alzheimer's disease, dementia, Parkinson, immune function, as well as autoimmune function, rep respiratory conditions, such as asthma and COPD, cancer, cognitive function and performance, such as attention and memory, falls as well, um, increased risk for falls, individuals who don't get adequate sleep, as well as it can significantly impede um, kids getting significant or obtaining and achieving developmental milestones. It's been linked with increased risk for accidents and injuries, increased risk for obesity, as well as a wide variety of different cardiometabolic risk factors like insulin sensitivity and blood pressure and the like, bone health, quality of life, work productivity, physical activity, as well as sedentary behavior. And the perfunctory question you may ask is, how is it that sleep has such a global effect on us? And my response really would be that in many ways that sleep is so important to us that it may lead to acute and long-term biological system failure and deterioration, which is why I say that sleep in many ways is fundamental and primordial, meaning everything emanates from it. And if we turn our attention, you know, specifically to cardiovascular disease, I am curious, Dr. Alcantara, you've looked at racial disparities in sleep and cardiovascular health risks. Can you tell us more about what you've learned and specifically how sleep can play a role in elevating rates of chronic diseases, of chronic disease, excuse me, in uh, black and brown communities? Thanks so much, Jacqueline, for that uh, question and really delighted to join my fellow uh, panelists and colleagues. I think I want to sort of take your question and break it down into two uh, pieces. I think the first piece uh, that I want to answer is that related to sleep 
health disparities or sleep disparities. And what we know from the literature, from sort of evaluating the evidence is that when you look in the aggregates so sort of at the population level, we see that uh, racial ethnic minorities compared to non Latinx white um, adults and individuals, we see that poor people compared to those with higher socioeconomic status, they tend to be at higher risk to experience some of the sleep problems and sleep disturbances along those dimensions that Dr. Seishas had talked about earlier. Um, so there is consistent early evidence, and for some of these dimensions more so than others, in particular for sleeping less than uh, the recommended number of hours of sleep, that Black and brown people or people of color are disproportionately at risk to experience those um, conditions. So that's one important, I think, piece of information is that there is literature already established that those um, uh, exist. When we then look at the linkages between uh, you know, disparities and even some of the health conditions that, that were mentioned earlier, which have also been shown to be pretty uh, persistent and pervasive, we found that sleep uh, in, you know, some studies, including one uh, that our group here at Columbia had done, where it was adults uh, who uh, came to the hospital um, after suffering from a heart attack, uh, they were in the hospital, they were then discharged. Um, and what we did is follow them for a year to see who was at risk for having another major uh, adverse cardiovascular event, be it a heart attack, unstable um, an angina, or another uh, or death uh, from that cardiovascular event. We also tracked their sleep for that month, uh, for a month um, after their hospital, uh, their discharge. And what we found is that specifically for Black adults who slept less than seven hours on average in that month after their uh, being discharged from the hospital, they were the only group who were at higher risk of experiencing another major adverse cardiovascular event. And these are adjudicated outcomes. So it's not self-reported outcomes. This is based on hospital records. These are based on death records. And so it seems like there's something uh, really pernicious about the combination of race ethnicity and uh, particularly black identified race here and sleeping less than seven hours um, of sleep that puts you at this elevated risk of having another uh, cardiovascular event. And so there, you know, there's, I think, a lot more uh, research to be done, including more me mechan mechanistic research to really try to understand the specific ways in which sleep uh, of, of places uh, Black identified adults at acute uh, risk for another major cardiovascular event. But we do have established research both to support sleep health disparities along racial ethnic lines, and then also that sleep may be an important, uh, some might even say mediator, in trying to understand the role of racial ethnic differences in cardiovascular disease. So Dr. Alcantara, as we think about sleep as a, a mediator, as you said, or, or quality of sleep as a social determinant of health, can you break down you know, what are specifically the environmental and social factors that contribute to poor sleep and how they disproportionately affect black and brown communities and then a follow-up to that would be, how can we then make sure sleep interventions are culturally appropriate? Yeah, and th this is like, you know, I want to say the million dollar question or two, but I, I think I love your question because it really shifts the focus from the individual and focusing on individual level factors to really sort of widening that lens to look at more macro level factors. So specifically that area of social determinants, which are these non-medical factors that influence uh, where you work, where you live, where you play, that affects then your access to risks or exposure to risk and then access to resources that then shape your risk for sleep problems. And so we know, for example, that, uh, you know, uh, marginalized communities, racial ethnic minorities are more likely to live in neighborhoods um, with socioeconomic disadvantage. And so that, you know, can include um, uh, neighborhoods that might have higher policing, neighborhoods that then have greater exposure to noise pollution, greater exposure to light pollution, and all these factors which we know that impact in the short-term sleep and then uh, can have these cascading long-term effects on uh, sleep as well and, and health in uh, as well. So it's not um, I think it, it really is about thinking about broadening the lens beyond just the individual to really those macro environmental level factors. And, you know, something that's really important when I often talk about this work and, and really try to make a convincing case for why there are these racial ethnic disparities in sleep is um, to make sure to clarify that what I'm not implying is that there are genetic differences that are contributing to who's at risk of, you know, uh, of having uh, sleep problems um, and how that may differ by 
by race, but really where we have to look at just what you said, those social and environmental factors that place people uh, in you know, neighborhoods that might have more um, exposures to the kinds of factors that increase their risk of sleep, like I mentioned before, noise pollution, um, light pollution, uh, uh, et cetera, access to treatment and whatnot. Yeah, yeah those environmental and social factors. Um, I'd like to also kind of turn our focus to looking at sleep and your brain. And we know that sleep plays an important role in our memory, particularly in children and teens. So Dr. Spencer, how important is sleep for young people and how can lack of sleep early on in life affect us in the long run? Yeah, so I'll start by saying that whole role of sleep and memory is is really something that I think is important to think about. And the way I like to put it is when you sleep, you're taking this movie of your day and you're putting it on replay. And it's this great mnemonic device. It's a way to really solidify the memories that we form during our day. And so if you think that during development, you're learning so much and you're processing so much, and some of those things are these emotional things that happen to us that we can then filter out and decide what to spend more time thinking about. And that's really a critical function of sleep for all ages. Um, But when we're young and we're learning a lot, that's when some of those functions might be most important. And when you're really young, if you miss a sleep out, so we can look, for instance, in preschoolers, and they are regular nappers. And if a a habitually napping child misses their nap for one reason or another, they're going to forget up to 18% of what they learned in the morning versus if they take that nap, those memories are protected. So that's this really significant difference that sleep can make and why it's so important for learning at such a young age. Um, And it's also important to think that there's with lack of sleep is also doing the opposite, right? So when we keep them awake, they're forgetting. When we keep them awake, they're also not processing all of the emotions that they carried with them throughout the morning. Not processing emotions is really what leads us to having poor mood and possibly things that build up into psychopathologies as they grow up. I mean, the other thing that I think is really important to think about with sleep in young kids is this is the time when they're really learning sleep habits. And so a good sleeping child grows up into a good sleeping adolescent, grows up to being a good sleeping adult. And so lack of sleep as a child is also building up poor sleep habits um, that can really stick with them. You know, you talked a lot about the importance of napping just then. And is there an age when you would recommend a child stops napping? When do we stop our naps? Yeah, well, as adults, we would all love to keep napping. And the upside is napping is good for everybody. So if you do take a nap, naps are going to be functional and naps are going to do something good for your memory, no matter what age you're at. It's just how bad is it to not nap that changes. And so when you look at these little ones, when naps seem to be so essential, um, that's that's when um, they really need them because their brains are so small. They don't have, an, they're also learning a ton. So if you think you've got tons of information coming in, you're also got like a very little palette to put them on you have to unload that information more frequently. And so that's what's happening in development and why they have this really huge sleep need, but it needs to be distributed. So they learn a little, they pack it away. They learn a little, they pack it away. That's true in these younger ones where the brains are small, the brains are less mature, and so they need to do that more frequently. And so it's up until about three to five years of age, typically more like four to five, that they really need to have some napping in the middle of the day in order to carry it on um, and and not lose memories. After that point, again, sleep can be, naps can still be beneficial. They're just not as essential as they are for those young ones. Yeah. And at any age, you know, we experience the most significant effects of lack of sleep when we're jet lagged, for instance, or after staying up all night. But also I'm curious, What do we know about how the brain functions during those overnight hours? And Dr. Klerman, uh, this question's for you. Can you speak specifically about working overnight and what do we know? So once again, thank you for asking me and uh, to participate in this esteemed panel. I've already learned a lot. 
So unfortunately, we don't know a lot about what happens in the middle of the night. Um, many researchers don't necessarily want to be up in the middle of the night to study what happens to people in the middle of the night. And yet there are millions of people awake in the middle of the night, either because they have to, because they have a job in security or transportation or medicine or clinical care, or because they don't want to because they have insomnia or they have pain. There is not a lot of direct evidence about what happens. Many studies of sleep deprivation actually ask what happens in the morning rather than in the middle of the night. However, we do know that the brain operates differently in some ways because there tends to be more risky behaviors in the middle of the night. There's more suicides in the middle of the night relative to the amount of people that are awake. There's more sort of rumination. If you're awake, you sort of have these feelings that you have problems sort of breaking out of um, patterns of thinking. Um, there's some evidence that people take more risky behaviors that they are less likely to process things the same way as they do when they're awake during the day. And so I am hoping and trying very hard that a lot of researchers will increasing sleep studies of people's wake functioning at night because there are so many people at night. And if they're awake at night, how do they operate at night? And also how do they then operate during the day? That is an interesting area of research uh, to watch specifically. And also when you think about um, as we age, it can be harder to get a good night's sleep and, and you might have some disruptions in, in sleep during the night. And we know that sleep impacts our memory, our memory, excuse me. But what about uh, neurological conditions as well, like Alzheimer's, Parkinson's? How could uh, getting better sleep help treat or even prevent these diseases, uh, Dr. Seishas, I'll turn that to you. Sure. Uh, so there's been mounting evidence um, globally that shows that individuals who don't get sufficient sleep, and um, my good colleague and friend, Dr. Alcantara, had shared that um, there, that, you know, it's one of the things that we can't do is that, you know, if you get less than seven hours of sleep, that you're at an increased risk for, um, you know, dementia, Alzheimer's disease, as well as Parkinsonian conditions and symptoms as well. So I just want to ensure that I kind of provide, you know, some kind of context um, and understanding to your audience as to what might be going on. Why is it that sleep is so important for these neurological conditions? And I would highlight, I think, four ways in which, uh, I'm gonna use them as metaphors as to how sleep operates. Sleep can act as a catalyst or a trigger, or it could act as a cleaner or a protector, or um, as a defragmentation tool. So let me take the first one, as a catalyst or as a trigger. What happens during sleep, and when you don't get sufficient sleep, is that it can trigger what I call epigenetic processes where you can increase cognitive decline and dementia. What does it mean? It means therefore that if an individual who has a genetic predisposition for neurological disorders like Alzheimer's and dementia, that not getting sufficient sleep may actually trigger that epigenetic process, that biological mechanism that may accelerate the development of such disease, particularly dementia. Let's focus on sleep as a cleaner. There's been more evidence showing that sleep is really critical as a cleaner, almost like a vacuum system, whereby over the given day that um, your neurons, which are your brain cells, um, may um, produce what we call beta amyloid. These are protein debris, um, particularly in the brain region. And when you sleep, that many of these neurons actually shrink and it allows the brain to wash and to clean itself. And so that is many ways how sleep can help to clean the brain of these very potential toxic um, you know, proteins that are linked with Alzheimer's disease and dementia. Let's look at sleep as a protector. One of the things that we do know is that outside of Alzheimer's disease, um, that vascular dementia is a highly prevalent form of dementia. And this is primarily driven by cardiometabolic risks, such as elevated blood pressure, as well as elevated and unhealthy levels of glucose, as well as cholesterol. These can cause micro lesions in your brain, whether in terms of white matter hyperintensities. And these over time, if not detected, 
can actually cause cognitive decline as well as increase someone's risk for vascular dementia. Sleep is critical in the sense that it helps to protect the brain from having these types of lesions where sleep can help to reduce blood pressure. Sleep in many ways is connected to blood pressure dipping, which is something that we oftentimes need. Everyone goes through that. And sleep helps to protect us from these vascular risks that can cause vascular dementia. And the last area, sleep works like a defragmentation. Like, I don't know if anyone still does this with their computers, but the more we pile on ourselves each day, that sleep in many ways helps to consolidate all the different cognitive functionings, all the experiences that we have. And in many ways, sleep can help to recenter um, in many ways the brain whereby it can reduce cognitive load, reduce brain fog, and therefore it can increase cognitive speed and processing. So those are the four ways in which sleep in many ways impacts risk for dementia as well as cognitive function. Yeah, and when we think about those uh, health benefits of sleep, the way that you broke that down, Dr. Seychas, I think that we should also talk about, well, how can we improve our sleep? How can we really get the most benefit from it? And I know that some people out there might consider themselves early birds, others night owls, but what role exactly does our natural circadian rhythm play in sleep cycles? And while being an early bird is, you know, often beneficial in the way that uh, we function in society and the way schools are typically structured, are there other benefits to being an early riser? Uh, Dr. Spencer, I'm curious what you think. Yeah, I mean, I think that being an early riser certainly aligns us with a lot of the expectations of the world. So like you pointed to schools, but, um, you know, being a professor and even in a college environment, we see that a lot of things start early um, and you look at what time business is open and you look at what time meetings are scheduled. And so I think that the early risers somehow get those kind of benefits that maybe we're not setting the late risers up for success in that way. Um, and it's also about, you know, when you have access to, to light. And, and so in some places, and we'll talk about this, I think more, but um, depends upon what time your sun comes up. And what, and for us in the Northeast, um, you know, we, if we have sun to help us wake up in the morning, that's going to be beneficial no matter what chronotype you have. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, there's also a lot of uh, mental health, uh, you know, interventions that expand into the digital space space that actually help with uh, promoting quality sleep. Dr. Alcantara, is there a role for these types of apps and other digital technology in helping people get a better rest? Yeah, thanks for that question, Jacqueline. You know, I think something to note is that there's been a proliferation of apps, I think, targeting sleep problems and also a proliferation of research testing whether these apps or digital technologies or digital treatments improve sleep. The best evidence that we have right now are for, for digital, and that can be online treatments or app-based treatments for uh, chronic ins uh, for the treatment of insomnia and specifically uh, a type of psychological treatment called cognitive behavioral therapy for insomnia, which is the gold standard first line of defense for the treatment of insomnia. There's been lots of studies to show that that delivered uh, via an app or online actually is as effective uh, in, in reducing insomnia symptoms in the short term and the long term than uh, sort of a, a similar type of um, education or psychoeducation based program. So there's a lot of reason, I think, to be excited about the potential for these digital technologies to help people improve their sleep. You know, I often think about sleep as a, as a social justice um, issue. And in thinking about uh, sleep as a social justice issues and considering equity issues in terms of who has access to treatments and who doesn't, um, I think with this digital therapeutics, we have to think about, well, who, who was a part of the studies uh, that informed the evidence, right? Who's missing from those studies? And what we know is that a lot of these treatments have been developed with highly educated populations, predominantly white identified um, individuals, mostly English speaking. And what that means is there's a lot of gaps in terms of understanding under what conditions and for whom do these types of digital technologies, digital treatments um, work? And, you know, in the area of mental health care, as I mentioned, cognitive behavioral therapy is 
the first line of treatment for insomnia. So if you have insomnia, you know, the, the, the recommendation uh, is, you know, find yourself a behavioral health care provider who's trained in that. But what we know is that there's a major supply and demand issue. Demand for qualified providers is high, uh, but the supply is quite low. And so you can see that being really magnified when you think about non-English speaking uh, uh, communities. And so digital therapeutics, I think part of why I'm excited about that and pursuing some of um, these studies where we're testing, you know, taking an evidence-based treatment like this, adapting it, then testing, testing it using rigorous methods um, and seeing if it's effective is because we're never going to have enough trained behavioral health care providers who speak Spanish. And so we have to think about, you know, for example, how can we leverage some of these, um, uh, you know, digital technologies, digital therapeutics to address this mental health care need, particularly if we think that everyone should have everyone should sleep well, right? If we think about it as a, as a sleep health, as a, as a social justice issue, then it becomes an imperative to really think about how can we design interventions with an equity focus to try to ensure access, I think, from, from the beginning. Um, so there's a lot of excitement, a lot of, I think, promise, a lot more research to be done, but what's really important is centering equity in that kind of research and that kind of implementation. Yeah, yeah. Like you said, everyone should sleep well. And uh, Dr. Clorman, for times when we might not get the recommended amount of sleep, can we make up for lost sleep like during the week with longer periods of uh, sleep on the weekends or by napping? Is there any way to make up for the sleep that we might lose? Yes, nap. I totally agree. Sleep in on weekends and nap. And related to your question about morning people versus evening people, evening people, evening crepe chronotypes are people who wanna to go to sleep later and wake up later. And as you noted, they can't get as much sleep as they want during the week because they have usually social obligations. And so they will wanna sleep in on weekends. And we say, if you can sleep, you, you should sleep. That there's no evidence that you can oversleep. I saw that one of the questions was, can you oversleep? Um, unlike chocolate cake or eating when you can eat when you're not hungry, there is no evidence that you could sleep when you're not tired. You might feel a little groggy when you wake up and that's because your brain is waking up. But if you want to sleep and it's a safe place for you to sleep, please give yourself a chance to sleep. And Dr. Corman, a follow-up for you, plus I'll make this a lightning round. So everyone jump in after Dr. Corman, but in just a few sentences, what's your best advice for someone trying to improve their sleep just in general? So in general, if you're in a safe place to sleep, and you can give yourself time to sleep. Um, uh, there are what are called sleep education or sleep hygiene, where you don't watch a horror movie before you go to sleep. Um, you relax and you try and go to sleep, don't have caffeine too late. There are a number of things, but most people don't give themselves enough time to sleep. And hopefully that's not because they have family or work other obligations. They're working two to three jobs and they don't. But even for people who don't have those other obligations, they just don't give themselves enough time. And so I say, as the other panelists have said, it's vitally important that you give yourself time to sleep. Your body, allow yourself, allow your, allow your body to sleep. Sorry about that. <laughs> If, if I can jump in, uh, I think this is the lightning round portion. If I can jump in, uh, Jacqueline, I think something when I talk to community members about sleep and, you know, often these are um, communities who are working multiple jobs or who are um, commuting. I, I'm here based in New York City and, and commuting is a, is a normal sort of course of life. Um, and so one of the biggest, um, I think, or important tips I try to emphasize is just the importance of a bedtime routine. Oftentimes people know this, it's intuitive when thinking about children and helping children establish a bedtime routine, but somewhere along the way that uh, I think practice um, becomes less common as people enter into adulthood. And so trying to, I think, re remind people that sort of our body and our brain needs those cues to help us um, be at an optimal place to get uh, you know, if we create opportunities to sleep, to get, uh, you know, um, to get good sleep and high quality sleep. So I think that's one of the recommendations is, is reminding people, remember what you would do for your, if you have children or if you are, are caretakers of, of younger kids to help them establish a routine. Now think about doing that for yourself um, as well. 
Yeah, I can go next. Um, that I really like to think of controlling the controllables. So, um, you know, making sure that you have access to light during the day and exposing yourself to light during the day, particularly outside natural light, but then keeping your environment dark at night. And sometimes you don't have a lot of control over the light. So maybe you, you want to wear an eye mask. Um, maybe you don't have a lot of control over the temperature of your room, but maybe you can open a window. Um, maybe you don't have a lot of control over sounds in your environment, but maybe you can use a white noise app. So trying to think of ways that you can make that sleep environment as comfortable as possible and sleep promoting as possible. And a lot of those things that I mentioned are also portable. So if you find yourself traveling a lot, you can bring the eye mask and the app and you know things with you to help you have a consistent and controlled, comfortable sleep environment. I, I think I go ahead, Dr. Dr. Clerman, if that's okay, go ahead. I'll, I'll wait on my, 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 go ahead, please. Sorry, um, I really want to hear what you say. So I just want to add that there are sleep disorders that may interfere with people's ability to sleep. And if you are tired after being in bed for around eight hours, or your bed partner says that you snore, or you stop breathing, or you are really kicking and active in your sleep, um, you should consult a doctor because there may be sleep disorders that we can treat that will help you um, sleep better. So I'm sorry. Um, no, that's totally fine. You you, you yeah. chose the one that I was gonna say. I'm just joking. I'm just joking. I'm just trying to bring <laughs> some levity. Um, so so my I have two suggestions, um, and they are, they sit at the intersection of culture and psychology. I oftentimes say that our society, in many ways, you know, privileges people who can go nonstop. And in many ways, sleeping and resting seems like an antithesis to who we are as a culture. But there is a paradigmatic shift that we can share with folks, and I hope people are hearing this. Two things. One is, um, I oftentimes say, start your day with sleep. I know it sounds weird because people usually sleep at night, but here's how I oftentimes break it down. Let's say you have a busy day ahead tomorrow and you know that the sleep is going to be your fuel so that you can perform at your optimal best. Therefore, you must be able to treat your day, meaning the night before, as if it were the beginning of your day. Because if you have a tough day ahead and all of us have busy schedules and lead very socially demanding lives, that you must start your day with sleep. So therefore, sleep is not seen as something that is short-chained because oftentimes we see sleep as a nuisance. It gets in the way of us getting and being productive. So I think start your day with sleep. And the second thing is you must see sleep as an investment whereby the more you can invest in your health, the more you can invest in career and all of those things, sleep in many ways can be that, you know, super, you know, um, you know, uh, thing that can allow you to really um, allow you to maximize your day. So two things, start your day with sleep and see sleep as an investment. Jacqueline, may I add one, one more to this great list? And I think everyone here would approve, you know, there's been a lot of really great research, uh, I want to say in the past decade or, or recently to emphasize the importance of sleep regularity. And so making sure that you're waking up at the same time every day, regardless of week weekday or weekend, and then that you're that you're going to bed at the same time, and then that you're waking up at the same time, and that is, in, in some ways, it can be very counterintuitive in, because you want to sort of sleep in, you want to catch up on sleep, but what we know from research is that that kind of sleep regularity is really important uh, in terms of promoting uh, good uh, health outcomes. So I just wanted to to add that. Uh, no, that. actually, I'm going to slightly disagree. I'm going to say it depends on how much sleep you get during the week. If you really haven't gotten enough sleep during the week, then I would say you should sleep in on weekends to catch up on sleep. Uh, but if you know, you know, if you're getting four or five hours of sleep at night during the week, then you need the extra sleep. But otherwise, if you are approximately getting the right amount of sleep, I totally agree that sleep regularity is very important. It's just that if you're not getting enough sleep, the overwhelming disadvantages of insufficient sleep, I think, in my, my professional opinion, override the advantages, the disadvantages of having irregular sleep. So they're both important. They're just slightly complicated message. Sorry if I confuse people. 
That's very helpful. Thank you, Dr. Clerman. And thank you, Dr. Alcantara. Um, I think that, you know, these are great tips and great uh, information for all of us to take away to our daily lives. So, so thank you. Thank you for that. And thank you for that clarification. Uh, and I think uh, we've covered a lot when it comes to sleep and health, but I also want to shift the discussion to sleep and policy. And in recent years, there's been a lot of debate surrounding school start times and the ed education policies there. We know that the state of California now requires middle schools start no earlier than 8 a.m., high schools no earlier than 8.30 a.m., is this something more schools should consider, Dr. Clerman and Dr. Spencer? Uh, any thoughts on this and what real world implications are we seeing so far, at least in California? Yeah, so what California has implemented is really based on years of research that show that when you shift high schools and middle schools to a later start time, it's associated with a lot of really positive outcomes. I mean, the academic outcomes are number one, but you also see health outcomes that improve just simply like more kids are eating breakfast and there's good things about eating breakfast to start your day. Um, you see fewer car accidents in these young drivers. And so there's a lot of research to say like what they're doing and what they're motivated by is the right thing to do. And it's also consistent with the American Academy of Pediatrics recommendation as well. Um, and we know like one success is they've been setting the stage for now other states to follow suit. So Maine right now is interested in doing the same thing that California implemented. I mean, so one thing that we see though, that's possibly uh, an after effect of this is a lot of school district, including my own school district, do, do a flip flop. And so the elementary schoolers that typically had started later now are the ones to go to school earlier so that the high schoolers can go to school yeah, after 830. And, you know, there's some studies that say when those elementary school st kids start earlier, that it's OK. Well, so far, we know that it, we don't have a lot of data on that. And we do know that there are some sacrifices that those littler kids are making. So even though on average, those little kids can handle an earlier start better, we know there's a lot of cases, particularly kids that come from low income households, that their sleep is going to be compromised with an earlier start time. So for instance, those kids that live in low income households are more likely to have parents that shift work. They go, they have scheduling um, things that keep them out later. So now you're going to have a really young kid with an overall shorter um, sleep out at night. And that has a lot of um, negative repercussions. So there's things like that, that we're going to need to be mindful of as this shift continues. So I believe that California is leading the way on something that more and more school district and states are picking up on. And we need to now maybe shift our focus into these littler kids that might be um, facing some of the negative consequence. Yeah, there's some unintended consequences there. Uh, Dr. Corman, did you have any uh, thoughts on school start times? I have nothing to add to what Dr. Spencer just said. Thank you. Got it. And uh, Dr. Seychas, I know that uh, you've proposed a precision and personalized population health framework to research on sleep and sleep-related health problems. When we think about sleep and policy, can you share more about what do policymakers need to know about this framework? Sure. Thank you so much again for the opportunity to discuss this. It's something that we've created here at the University of Miami. School of Medicine, particularly in our Center for Translational Sleep and Circadian Sciences. And here's what we say. We're saying that in order for us to provide policymakers and the entire ecosystem, and this include um, parents and, and you know, patients and the community and the public and providers and you know, payers and, and everyone, the way in which we can create, I think, you know, paradigmatic changes into how we roll out policy is by making our research and our evidence more robust. And so what we've proposed is how is it that we can capture different types of data? And I think some of my esteemed colleagues have already started discussing the importance of data. But what we've, what we've done thus far is that we've laid out exactly the types of data that are needed to be able to take a 360 degree perspective to understand sleep. It's taken, if you wanna take a 360 degree perspective, we have to, we say that you have to look at data as what we call rhizomatic. And what that means is that you can look at data coming from multiple sources that are not necessarily, you know, hierarchical in any way, where you're not privileging clinical data over social determinants of health data. 
And once you've been able to capture all those data, let's say school start time, let's say, you know, shift work, let's say the impact that sleep has on health outcomes. Now, once you capture that 360 degree perspective, looking at the person's biology, um, looking at their behaviors, looking at their so, um, social context and social environment, looking at environmental factors, then you need to be able to lay out a really robust analytical plan as to how we can capture that. And what we've been able to demonstrate, and I think some of us have already alluded to it, but we'll be a little bit more direct, that when you look at advanced types of analyses, you can see sleep as an omni phenomenon. I know we were talking about you know, sleep as a predictor of many health outcomes and potentially a consequence. But we see sleep as an omni phenomenon, meaning that it's a predictor, it's a correlate, it's an artifact, it's a consequence of many different health outcomes, right? It's sleep and dot, dot, dot. And so when you understand that, then it allows you to translate those analyses on a continuum, what we call discovery from description all the way to optimization. And once you understand what are causes, what are the, 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 the causes of disease, what are um, the, the, the drivers of you know, treatments and why some treatments work for whom across different contexts, um, then we are able to then look at how is it that we can make our translation on our healthcare delivery more seamless from awareness then to avoidance, then increasing access, increasing assessments. Um, we know that you know, many, if you go to you know, your primary care provider, they don't really ask about sleep. But when we collect those data, what are those providers going to do? Are we going to you know, um, you know, triage individuals and provide care? We need to be able to find ways of how to do that. It will also allow us to increase, how is it that we can improve acceptance to treatments as well as adherence? And so what this translational approach in terms of precision personalized population health, which is how is it that we can study the community or the population to inform the individual in terms of particular treatments, it could be personalized treatments, but there, how can the evidence from that funnel back into the community for us to understand which treatments work for whom, at what time, at what dosage, across which context. And in many ways, I think that's what policymakers want. They want more robust, comprehensive data that will allow them to get to the root of understanding the insights um, in many ways from description to optimization. And then they want data, good data, that will allow us to increase the healthcare delivery, and that's the value chain that we're trying to do. And I think some, that's, this is something that policymakers and all of us need to really look into as we try and make sleep health for all. Yeah, I can only imagine all of the questions, you know, left to answer and that we could answer if we do get that that population uh, data when it comes to sleep and health. Uh, that's a very, very important message there, Dr. Seishas. Thank you for that. Uh, another topic when it comes to policy here, we know that very soon we'll be turning the clocks ahead for daylight saving time. And last March, the Senate voted unanimously in favor of the Sunshine Protection Act, which would make daylight saving time permanent year round. Question for everyone, but I'll start with Dr. Clorman. How would that impact people's sleep cycles? And are you in favor of permanent daylight saving? So not only am I against permanent daylight saving, every virtually every scientific community is against permanent daylight saving and for permanent standard time. And the Sunshine Protection Act does not protect sunshine. The amount of sunshine is the same, whether or not you're in daylight saving time or not. Uh, and what um, also happened in the Congress is that a few weeks before that Senate vote, the House of Representatives had a hearing about daylight saving versus standard time and decided that there wasn't enough information. And, and then the Senate turned around and didn't request any information and voted unanimously. So the scientific community is a little confused about how to, how, what kind of science can we do? How can we transform our science into policy? As Aziz has just said, what is needed? What we do know is that being in standard daylight saving time is like living in the wrong time zone. You're switching the clocks to one time zone to the east. Uh, we've been talking about the importance of morning light. Morning light is how your body 
knows what time of day it is. If you've ever had jet lag or worked a night shift, you know when your body clock is out of sync with the outside world. And by switching to daylight saving time, you are switching the clocks without switching what your the signals that your body needs to know what time of day it is. It's not like jet lag because for jet lag, you're switching the light signal as well as the clock signal. And so people tend to stay awake later because the clocks look later and the sun looks later, which means that they stay awake later, but they still have to wake up at the same time or earlier because you've switched the clocks. And now we're talking about all the disadvantages of insufficient sleep that my esteemed colleagues have mentioned earlier. Um, and also it will totally reverse the later school start times <laughs> issue because you're now switching the clocks earlier again and instead of switching the clocks later. So the science is for that we should not switch to daylight saving time. Yeah, and I'll just add from a developmental perspective that we know that when um, we, if we were to switch to daylight, permanent daylight savings time, that poses some safety risk for kids even just going to school in the dark in the morning. So there's one thing about waking them up. There's another thing about keeping them safe when now you have cars driving on the road in the dark and kids waiting for school buses. So I just think that that's, you know, we have learned lessons from um, various different uh, uh, decisions in the past. And these are some of the things that we are, we know are some of the negative outcomes. And so it's going to be really important to push back on this decision. And so speaking of learning from the past, the United States has had permanent daylight saving time twice in the past, once in the 1915s, I think, and once in the 1970s with the energy policy. And both times it was turned back. It was repealed because it was so unpopular. So I'm not sure why we want to do it again. Also, the UK and Russia also at one point instituted the equivalent of permanent daylight saving time, and they were also reversed because they were so unpopular. So um, learning from the past, um, I would argue that's another reason not to do it again. And if I, um, I just want to contribute something on this point of policies and, uh, you know, and, and related to social determinants and the need really also for policies that address some, you know, issues related to social determinants. So policies that address structural racism that really has affected, you know, which communities have been exposed to and live in communities that are more socioeconomically disadvantaged or neighborhoods um, based on those beliefs and systems and policies that, uh, you know, racial, ethnic, minoritized communities, in particular Black communities, or, were uh, perceived as um, less than and needing to, you know, by white identified um, uh, individuals in positions of power and, and, and structures uh, to sort of perpetuate this system and the status quo. So I think it's important in any kind of policy conversation to remember that there's also policies that can also, that we can advocate for policies to improve neighborhoods, to improve communities, to address issues of structural racism in healthcare, structural racism in housing policies, practices, and neighborhoods that in turn would actually have these, um, I think, uh, downstream effects on behaviors like, like sleep. So uh, just wanted to make sure we included that in our conversation of policy. And Dr. Alcantara, when we consider, you know, that uh, in black and brown communities, we do see a disproportionate uh, impact of sleep loss and sleep quality. So as we talk about daylight saving time and having this policy debate, I'm fascinated by the uh, idea that falling back, springing forward during daylight saving time can have a subsequent disproportionate impact on black and brown communities because of the already pre-existing disparities we see in sleep there. I'm curious your thoughts on that as well. I think you just articulated it beautifully. And I, you know, I feel like there's so much um, that needs to be involved in terms of uh, like stakeholder involvement and even thinking about public health messaging, because there's a disconnect. We have great science, and yet there's a disconnect with what policymakers are hearing, what the public is hearing, are, are I think, uh, forgetting of history, as Dr. Clerman mentioned. So I think really it seems like it's rife for um, some research targeted around public campaigning, messaging to really um, promote the science that we know and, and I think the concern about disproportionate impact in uh, black and brown communities, like, like you mentioned, of policies like, uh, like the ones we were just talking about. So I totally agree that there's a lot to be learned from um, about how to take science and make it into policy. And I think we can learn from um, 
experience with the cigarette smoking in public and from other health campaigns like cigarette smoking in public, seatbelt use, drunk driving, where it was a combination of science, public policy, public education, advocacy. And so I think all of them are going to be important in trying to address the daylight saving time issue, as well as other things related to structural um, and racial inequalities that we need science, but we also need communication, we need education, we need advocacy. We can do this. We have done this with cigarette smoking and wearing a seatbelt. Um, it takes a lot more, more than just knowing the science. Thank you for that. And as we approach our final 10 minutes, we do have some audience questions for the panel. So I'll start with uh, the first question here. Are there any effects of sleep deprivation that are reversible or irreversible? Excuse me. I know we talked about ways to improve sleep, but are there any effects that sadly are irreversible? Dr. Corman? Uh, if you have an accident because you're sleep deprived, that would be irreversible. Um, are you talking That's about short? Point. I wasn't sure about this. So in terms of short term versus long term, if you didn't get enough sleep for one or two nights, there's fairly good evidence that you're fine um, if you get the sleep on weekends or something like that. Over long term, as has been mentioned, there's effects on memory, there's effects on your risk of dementia, there's effects on many things. So short term, I think it's fairly well known that you can make up a couple nights of insufficient sleep, hopefully on the weekend or on a vacation, but long term, there are these cumulative effects that my colleagues have mentioned. Yeah, I think we, we did talk about, um, as you mentioned, the increased risk for, for various uh, chronic diseases that you know would help answer that question of irreversible effects. And when we think about, um, making up sleep loss. There is a question here from the audience. Are four two hour sleep increments as good as eight consecutive hours? I'm curious what the panel thinks about that. No, I, well, first of all, if you can only sleep in four two hour increments, then you should sleep. But the sleep is different at night versus during the day and some types of sleep sort of have to cycle through, you have to have some, you have to have what's called non-REM sleep before you can have the REM sleep. And that takes a while. And so if you keep on stopping it, you're not going to get to all the different stages of sleep that you need. That's my... So you well, need those consecutive hours for the sleep. benefits. Right. It's, yeah, I'll just add, I think, um, not to speak for Dr. Alcantara, I think that's what she was trying to allude to earlier about having a consistent routine. It's consistent routine of consolidated sleep. And what we've shown and what the research has shown is that overwhelmingly people who actually have a consolidated routine, meaning sleeping throughout a particular period, those individuals seem to get the best health benefits from sleep. And, 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 and I'm trying to understand the kernel of the question because I know oftentimes people try and ask us ways in which they can perhaps circumnavigate, you know, not actually get in sleep, right? And, and, there's, there, there, and that's the enigma of sleep. Um, and, and in many ways, there is a movement afoot where people are trying to, you know, create innovative, you know, solutions around sleep hacking. And, and that's where the data is still nascent, where we still don't know enough information about how is it that we can try these alternative modalities or treatments where we can try and optimize sleep, whatever that means for that particular individual. And that's where we have to be very careful about that. What the overwhelming evidence does say is routine consolidated sleep in overwhelmingly protects people from adverse health consequences and improves you know, performance and a whole host of other positive health outcomes. I'll just and add Dr. Sage to, sorry, the, um, so sleep fragmentation is what that essentially is. And a lot of middle-aged and older adults can speak from experience about that, right? And that there's not just the sleep going, sleep time going down as we get older, but you see increased sleep fragmentation in our older adult populations. And I can tell you from working with a lot of older adults that they'll, they'll say that from their experience, that if they even have, it might be a shorter night of sleep, but hey, I slept the entire time, they'll feel so much better. And we can look at that. We've shown in our memory studies that 
it's not just you need, you know, one sleep stage. So slow wave sleep, what you're doing is you're alter, you're going back and forth between non-REM and REM and non-REM and REM. And, and if you disrupt that at any point, you can't really just start all over and you're going to be at a different point in this evolution of your cognition. And so really that fragmentation is disrupting these processes. And, and unfortunately that might be some of what's going on when we see disruption in sleep and um, worsening cognition in our older populations, those two things might go hand in hand. Yeah. I'll just kind of end with this, if that's okay. So I agree wholeheartedly. I think the question is, if we add those hours together, it's still eight hours and the like, but it doesn't equal to good quality. And, and people need to be aware of that. Not all sleep are equal. And so I just want to end with that. Yes. And, you know, some people have to sleep hack, you know, so to speak, because they work an overnight shift, might be a single mother, someone might have three jobs. I mean, there's so many various uh, we talked about social determinants of health, so many various environmental and social factors where, um, you know, unfortunately, you, you simply can't get, you know, the consecutive hours that we discussed. And there's one question that does kind of touch on this uh, one audience question asking, what are the consequences on health? And I think we talked about this before, but they're asking, what are the consequences on the health of those who do spend years having to uh, sleep in increments or, or sleep hack because they work multiple jobs, because they work overnight, compared with those who do spend years getting consecutive eight hours each night. Do we know anything about the health impacts of being chronically sleep deprived? Or if your schedule for years is having you know overnight shift because it's uh, a schedule that your body's used to, uh, could the impacts somehow I don't know, balance out. I'm, I'm curious uh, the panel's thoughts on this. I'm, I'm happy to jump in um, if any, um, unless someone else would like to go. Um, so, so this is very near and dear to me because it's really a central focus of my research and personal because um, a lot of the women in, in my family are nurses and um, are shift workers and work at night. And I have seen the negative impact that it has had on them. What the research has borne out is that it increases um, what we call metabolic syndrome, where you can have a wide variety of different risks from diabetes to, um, you know, excess, you know, adiposity, um, elevated blood pressure. And if, if that is not addressed, that can really load someone's risk for an, an unfortunate um, in a heart, you know, you know, you know, bad heart, you know, um, event like a heart attack or a stroke, and and the, the the literature is very replete with that evidence. So 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 it's very overwhelming. Um, and so what we need to do, I hope, is that we have to have a serious policy discussion around individuals who are shift workers. What do we do? What we've done in our group is we said we oftentimes look at individuals who are, you know, single moms. And we say, if you can't get seven hours and you can only get six, what are some areas that you can shift? So we have used machine learning and artificial intelligence to come up with different profiles that can provide more personalized recommendations to individuals where if you can only get six hours of sleep, well, what, how much physical activity should you um, engage in in order to lower your risk? Um, what kinds of foods do you need to eat um, in order to lower your risk if you can't get that? And we've been able to find different profiles um, and different recommendations of people who may get six hours of sleep, but can make certain alterations in their lives and lifestyles to balance out their risk um, for cardi um, cardiometabolic health conditions. Yeah. And while we have two minutes left, my final question, if someone can answer this uh, very quickly, an audience member wants to know more about sleep apnea when to get tested, uh, what are some potential uh, therapies that can help? Can anyone uh, speak to that sleep apnea? I think I can speak to that because that's my ear as well. Um, so in terms of you know excessive loud snoring, if someone um, loses oxygen or feels as if they're um, tired when they wake up. Um, so those are some classic signs and symptoms. Treatments include oral appliances, 
positive airway pressure, and there's some other new age types of solutions, either be through surgery that can help. It really depends on the severity of the symptoms. And so I would strongly encourage someone to see a sleep um, um, specialist for that. Great. And with one minute left, I'll start with Dr. Alcantara. Can you each give one last brief advice for the audience? Lightning round. Oh boy. Um, I, you know, I think Dr. Um, Spencer mentioned this already, but I think um, getting exposure to bright light in the morning is just really important. And I think something that gets under um, estimated. Dr. Corman. <clears throat> Recognize the importance of sleep. As one of the founders of the field said, if sleep doesn't serve a vital and vital function, it's the worst mistake evolution ever made. So recognize that you need to sleep for so many aspects of mental and physical health. Dr. Spencer. Yeah, I would add exercising is something that you can do to, if nothing else, it can clear your mind. And really that's part of the rumination problem a lot of people have as they're trying to fall asleep. But we think it does some other things in terms of helping you sleep more soundly as well. So getting out, getting physically active will really help you sleep better at night. Mm. Dr. Seishev? Said it before, start your day with sleep and see sleep as an investment. Wonderful. Well, thank you all so much for your time. This has been a fantastic conversation. Like Dr. Seisha said, sleep is an investment. And if you missed any of today's panel, you can view the recording on demand on Harvard Chan School's YouTube page. Have a good afternoon, get some good sleep, and we'll see you next time.